and they will be presenting on Energy Poverty SOS. All right, thanks for coming today. As she said, my name is Rachel Stukenborg. This is Caitlin Tomlinson, and the title of our project is Energy Poverty SOS. So to give you an overview of our project, this is both a research and a creative project. And the purpose was to research and conduct data analysis of global energy poverty and to create a means to educate university students on that. And the way we did this was through our goal to produce pedagogical resources for faculty use, hopefully here at JMU and potentially at other universities, um, using Science on a Sphere, which is a spherical display system. And our inspiration for this project was through one of our courses, ISAT 311, or the role of energy in modern society. And this was both of our first exposure to the concept of energy poverty. And energy poverty is a topic that once you learn about, you're surprised it's something that not a lot of people talk about and how little well known it is. So, we wanted to create a means to share that knowledge. And in order to do this, we created four lesson plan packages that make up one product called Energy Poverty SOS. And since this is a product that we're hoping people will pick up and use, we wanted to give it a catchy name. So, SOS in the title, Energy Poverty SOS, serves as a pun. It stands for both Science on a Sphere and SOS, the common distress signal, because energy poverty is cause for distress. So, within this project, there was a division of labor because Caitlin is in the Honors College and she solely completed part of the project to fulfill her honors thesis requirements. And we wanted to clarify that we created these lessons, but they have not let, yet been piloted or evaluated for this, their successfulness. Um, but we're hoping with future work, people will pick it up and carry out this process. So to give you an overview of our presentation, we're first gonna be talking about what exactly is energy poverty and define it in the concepts of the energy ladder and the feedback loop that it uh, exists in with global poverty. Then we're gonna go over the methods we use to conduct data analysis as well as create our original um, science on a sphere, learning materials, and images. Finally, we're gonna go over what entails a lesson package, what science on a sphere actually is, what each of the lesson plans constitute of, and then our future work and conclusions for the project. So what is energy poverty? There's no universally accepted definition because it's such a complex problem. And therefore, this project uses a broad definition that it is the lack of access to electricity and clean cooking fuels. And there's a difference between fuels and facilities. So clean cooking fuels are what you use to burn, and that's what you create your energy with. And facilities are the means in which you burn those fuels. So an example of a clean cooking fuel would be kerosene. An example of the facility would be a gas stove or a kerosene lamp. Um, energy poverty is interesting because it's not black and white. People don't have e either 0% or 100% access to these energy services. There are levels and ranges in between there, and this project goes into dive into analysis of those different levels and ranges. To do that, we use different indicators, which are characteristics or signals that a household may be living within energy poverty. And so we use those to look at the different levels and compare different types of countries. So within that, you can look at underdeveloped countries versus developed countries and the differences they have with their energy access. Um, so energy, the energy ladder is a good way to look at the, the relationship between income or poverty and energy poverty. Along the x-axis, you can see income. As it goes to the right, you have um, higher income and less poverty. As you go up the y-axis, you have fuels and energy services, which lead to um, a higher access to clean energy. Um, the two, there are two extremes that we want to look at. In the bottom left corner, you have um, people will use biomass because this is a lot cheaper than electricity, so they'll use switchgrass, dung, and fuel wood, and that all has a lot of respiratory issues within it. And then if you look at the other extreme, which is what a lot of people in the US live with, we have access to electricity, which has no well-being consequences to it. And what I've just described is that energy poverty and global poverty exist in a feedback loop, which means that these two impact one another um, simultaneously. People living in poverty can't afford clean cooking fuels, nor the methods to burn them cleanly, because biomass is free versus electricity, which is something you have to achieve. And people who live without electricity or these clean cooking fuels have to focus their resources then on dealing with the, the well-being consequences that come with burning the free biomass. Therefore, they don't have economic growth and it keeps them in poverty. And when those people are living in poverty, they can't afford to break out of this energy poverty loop without any assistance or aid and therefore the cycle continues. Luckily, the UN has done something to try to alleviate this. 
they have developed the Sustainable Development Goals, and these are 17 standards in which they hope the, U, uh, the world will achieve 100% access to by 2030. And goal number seven is the most pertinent to this project. That is that the world will obtain 100% access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable modern energy. This is important because energy services are an integral part of everyday life and gaining them will drastically benefit the lives of millions. So think about what you guys have on a daily basis. You have refrigerators, you have heating and cooling, you have clean like gas stoves that don't have any kind of pollutants when you're cooking. So all these we kind of take for granted, but people that don't have electricity don't have these services as well. So since this problem cannot be solved overnight, this project operated under the team's belief that a, project, a problem cannot be solved without knowledge of the situation. So we would like to educate people on that. And our purpose was to develop a set of university level teaching and learning resources about energy poverty that incorporate the spherical display system, Science on a Sphere. So what is Science on a Sphere? Science on a Sphere is a spherical display system developed by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And what a spherical display system is, is a globe with animation capabilities. Other spherical display systems exist, but we chose to use Science on a Sphere because we have one here at JMU located in Memorial Hall. So what Science on a Sphere looks like is an auditorium with a six foot diameter globe in the middle. And it's surrounded by four projectors that can be used to project world maps onto it. And there are currently 136 locations of Science on a Sphere, both in the United States and around the world, in locations such as museums, colleges, science centers, and attractions like zoos and aquariums. So many data sets already exist for use on Science on a Sphere, and they're known as data sets, but what that means is anything that can be projected onto a sphere. So data sets can be still images, sequences of images, videos, and they can be either narrated or discussed live with an instructor. So the published data sets by NOAA exist in what's known as the SOS Data Catalog, and they're published online. This is an example of an already published data set. It's called the Blue Marble, and it's one of the most popular data sets. So we, for the purposes of this project, chose to use science on a sphere rather than traditional maps to present our data because energy poverty is a global problem. And globes are better than maps for showing the exact proportions and the extent of the energy poverty indicators. For example, with energy poverty, it's most prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. And when visualizing an indicator of energy poverty on a map versus a globe, when people see it on the globe, one of the first things they notice is how huge Africa is. So it really highlights the severity of the problem by using a globe versus a map. Our methodology for this project gets a little complicated because we had so many tasks that relied on information gained from other tasks. So things didn't really happen in a specific order, but we'll talk about them in a general order. So for example, we had to originally develop our big goals. So this is what we wanted everyone to learn from the lessons that we were creating. And from there, we delved into data analysis of indicators, but that required research from our lesson plans to understand what indicators showed different aspects of energy poverty. And from there, then we went to create our ArcGIS images, but some of those maps didn't turn out the way we expected to or had incomplete data, so then we'd have to go back and reevaluate. And as we were planning our lessons, we needed to figure out an orderly and logical progression throughout the lesson, so if the maps didn't work together, we'd have to go back and reevaluate our indicators once again. So like I said, a lot of things kind of interplay with each other, and that makes our methodology a little bit complicated. So as I just said, we started with the big goals of our project, and we originally had five, but we condensed them eventually into four lesson topics over the past two years. And we then identified the Bloom's taxonomy levels for each of those lessons. Bloom's taxonomy, taxonomy as you can see in the triangle on the right, um, is used to promote higher forms of thinking and determine the level of thinking and learning that each lesson is supposed to focus on. And we included this to help instructors know how in-depth lessons should be and what skills students will be focusing on. So for example, if you look at the bottom layer, it's remembering, so that would be what if we wanted students to just gain some factual understanding. And as you go up the triangle, you gain more analysis and problem solving skills. But we also refer to the Department of Energy Literacy Goals in order to compare our goals and lessons to the Department of Energy's determined fundamental concepts. This is important because we are teaching people about a topic they haven't been exposed to before. So these goals help us build knowledge from the ground up. So as Caitlin mentioned, each one of our big goals became a lesson. And the goal determined what indicators we chose would be most meaningful for each lesson. So for each lesson, 
we started out by compiling a list of existing science on a sphere data sets that might be useful to present our message, as well as indicators that could be turned into maps using our GIS software to present that same message. And continuing with the same example, to understand energy poverty and global poverty and the feedback loop between them, we found two data sets that might be useful that already exist, as well as a list of indicators that could be turned into maps. So by compiling this information, we had a big list of indicators we could choose from to use, but there was a lot of troubleshooting and manipulation in design choices, um, both with the color scale and the legend, and with available data to determine what would produce the most meaningful message. So the software we used to create our original data sets for use on science on a sphere is called ArcGIS. And this takes raw numerical data, as shown here, and turns it into a map, which can be exported into a JPEG format, which can then be projected onto science on a sphere. So when creating our maps on ArcGIS, there were several content creation guidelines um, that had to be taken into account in order so that the map could be projected onto science on a, sphere, on a sphere. The first of which was resolution. The images had to have a minimum resolution of 2048 by 1024 pixels with a recommended resolution of 4096 by 2048 pixels. So these are large, large files. And then the second recommendation was using a specific projection. And the projection is the way the latitude and longitude lines fall on the map, which affects the way that the map falls onto the globe. And the third recommendation were, were the dimensions, which is that the map had to be twice as long as it is wide in order for it to correctly wrap around the globe. So when making these maps, we started with a base world map with country borders, which contained all the country data and latitude and longitude data. And then we paired this country data with data that we downloaded in this format. So with ArcGIS, there was a lot of self-teaching and troubleshooting, because prior to this project, neither of us had any experience with the software. So we had to reach out to a lot of people for help, as well as struggle along with the process. So I'm going to go back on the slide. As you can see in this image, this is an example of our raw data. This specifically is pulled from the World Bank, and it's the percent of the population for specific countries with access to non-solid cooking fuels. And just to clarify, in the definition of energy poverty, it's known as clean cooking fuels, which determines if they're in energy poverty or not. But within this specific data set, this is um, the data that we could find to apply to that. And it's non-solid cooking fuels, which just, sorry, not cooking fuels, non-solid fuels, which just means fuels that are not biomass. So this is the map that was generated from that data. As you can see, the content creation guidelines are applied. It's twice as long as it is wide as a pixel resolution that was recommended. Um, and also, you can see that the data that was applied was divided into five different categories, which we split up using a color ramp. And then this is to get an example of that same map projected on signs on a sphere. So our primary data sources for maps that were generated using our GIS were World Bank and Columbia University CSIN which is the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. So World Bank was used for all indicator data except for population density, which was collected from CSIN. The World Bank data was organized by country and was given in Excel format, while the CSIN data was population density organized by square kilometer, which was um, supplied as a TIFF file, which could be pulled directly into ArcGIS. And for each one of these indicators, there was troubleshooting dependent on available data, which we'll see in the next slide. So this is an example of one of our maps we created that had incomplete data, and you can visually see the problems with it. So if you look at the continent of Africa, almost half of the countries are missing. So that leads us to inaccurate data, and we can't use this map. Even though this was the perfect indicator, female population that obtained secondary education, that's a great indicator for what we wanted to show. But because of the incomplete data, it wouldn't let us um, conduct complete analysis and be able to teach that. And labor force had similar issues, but we worked away around that one. So then we moved on to lesson planning. And our lessons are unique because they are a university level resource for science on a sphere, which is uncommon right now. So first we had to teach ourselves what a lesson plan is, what it entails, and how to create effective ones. We didn't know how to do that at all. So this was from the ground up. To do that, we conducted extensive research and we met with our advisors to discuss in detail how they work on their lesson plans and create them effectively. Then we moved on to writing literature reviews. So that was the research part for each topic. And then 
we had to do that to start our data analysis because that would lead us to the types of indicators we would need to look at. The data analysis then led us to making our own conclusions and that would eventually help us fine tune our main big goals at the end of the day. Once our indicators were set, we knew what we wanted to work with, we could download the data from the World Bank and then create our uh, map images. Visually seeing the data played a major factor in determining the indicators because we were able to narrow down the most useful data. And then this led to lesson sequence writing because we determined which ones looked the best and were, were able to portray what we were trying to say. We were then able to work on our pre and post lesson assessments, which were intended to help students gain an understanding of the concepts and material before they walked into the lesson, and then encourage more analysis and thought on their own afterwards. So like I said, we have four main lessons, which we turned into lesson packages. And what that means is that they had multiple parts to them, not just a lesson. And what those parts are, are a literature review, a lesson sequence, GIS images, clicker and worksheet questions along with answers, and pre and post assignments with rubrics. The fourth lesson, however, does not have those parts because it is taught off of the sphere. So there are no images and no clicker questions associated with that lesson in particular. Once these were done, we entered them into a template given to us by Dr. Hartman that they had been using, and this is to create uniformity throughout the packages so it becomes one clean lesson over four different uh, meeting periods. Here are some screenshots we took from our lesson one. So each lesson package will have its own table of contents because it's a different entity from each other. And here are some icons that we've been using in them to help with the uniformity and help ease the flow moving on from one lesson to another. So for example, we would have the learning objectives icon, where the objectives are, and the images, where we would start showing the images, pre and post lesson assessments, you can see on the right, just to help kind of make it more organized and more uniform. So the title of lesson one is the overarching problem of energy poverty. And within this lesson, our objectives were to define energy as a service. It's required for people to meet their fundamental needs. And then we wanted to define energy and global poverty and the fact that they exist in a feedback loop. So in order to do this, the indicators that we used are, first, the two parts of the definition of energy poverty, which are access to electricity and access to non-solid fuels. And these indicators uh, both exist in a format of percentage of population with access to said product, said uh, service. Um, we then use population density, which is population per square kilometer, and we use this to overlap with access to electricity and solid fuels to show the discrepancies between where people live versus where access to uh, energy services are. And finally, we used GDP PPP per capita, which stands for Gross Domestic Product Purchasing Power Parity, and this shows how much an average person makes uh, or earns money-wise adjusted to uh, the purchasing power of that currency in the given country. And the Bloom taxonomy level of this first lesson is on the bottom, remembering and understanding components, because this lesson serves to familiarize people with the concepts of energy poverty and global poverty and how they affect and exist intertwining with one another. So the images we used for lesson one are shown here. The first was a sequence of three image, images. The first of which is nighttime lights, which is a data set that already exists in the SOS data catalog. And this shows um, where people have access to electricity for lighting. The second was population density, which we generated from CSIN data. And this shows where people are in the world. And then finally, the third is population density overlaid with nighttime lights. And ideally, people would think that where people exist is where people have the most access to electricity. But as shown in this overlaying lab, which was a map, which was developed by NASA, um, certain areas of the world have high population, but not, not a lot of access to electricity. So people begin to see those discrepancies between the two. And then these three maps were generated from World Bank data, the first of which are the two parts of the definition of energy poverty. And the third is GDP PPP per capita, which represents global poverty in the form of economic poverty. So for our self-generated maps, for the color ramp, we decided that the dark side of the spectrum would represent the bad side of the indicator. So as you can see on all these maps, Sub-Saharan Africa and East Developing Asia are the darkest, meaning that these issues are most prevalent in this area. And by um, showing these images one after the other, the people observing this lesson begin to make connections and see that energy poverty and global poverty are entwined in this feedback loop. So here's a close-up of the NASA-generated image with nighttime lights overlaid with population density. So 
A few things to point out are areas of high development, such as the US and Europe, <coughs> are very well lit, but as you can see on the color ramp, which shows population density, is relatively low population. However, areas such as sub-Saharan Africa, rural India, rural China, very high populations, but not as much lighting as these areas. So when observing this map, people understand that high pop areas of high population don't necessarily have access to electricity that highly developed areas do. So all the Sphere Lessons implemented feedback and interactive tools, which included clicker questions and worksheets, such as the one that we handed out to you. Um, and clicker questions, what a clicker is, it's a tool given out to students that allows them to pull in answers to questions like this one. So this question was pulled from lesson one, and it's referring to the map we just looked at with population density overlaid with nighttime lights. So to kind of simulate the interactive environment we're hoping to produce with this product, help me answer this question. Where in the data sets, on the data set we just observed, are areas of high population without lights? So raise your hand. Is it A, Europe, the United States? Is it B, sub-Saharan Africa and rural China? Yes. Okay. I don't think we need to answer the others, but this is the, <laughs> this is the kind of questions we would be asking during our lesson. So here is the pre-lesson assignment for lesson one. It's broken into three parts. Uh, the first one is where students would do some readings and watch some videos to obtain some factual background information of the concepts. And then part B and C, students are assigned a developing country and an underdeveloped country and this way they can obtain some research background on their own of those countries and come in already knowing something about a country and then their focus will be directed in two different places. And this is the post assignment for lesson one. It's an essay to help um, encourage their analysis of what they learned and it pulls on their pre-lesson assignment. So the country they were assigned, they then follow through the whole lesson and then finish in their post-lesson assignment. Lesson two is set up very similar to lesson one, and they go very hand in hand. And this is the human well-being consequences. So the objectives of lesson two are that students will understand the concept of feedback loops, as well as how energy poverty degrades human well-being. And it's important to note that human well-being has three major categories. It's not just health. It's health, economic growth, and education. They all feed into one another and contribute to your well-being. And the indicators we used to analyze well-being consequences are primary education completion, labor force and agriculture, infant mortality, and particulate matter exposure. And Bloom's taxonomy level that we hit in this lesson are between understanding and analyzing. So they're moving away from factual recall and they're starting to analyze what really happens when you don't have energy access. And these are the four images that we created for lesson two, as you can see. I blew up infant mortality because it's such an important indicator. So infant mortality incorporates a lot of different well-being aspects and wraps into one nice, easy-to-read package. So infants in these uh, underdeveloped countries will spend at least the first five years of their life kind of following their mother around. So they're exposed to the most drastic conditions. They're exposed to the cooking environment where all the smoke is coming. They have to travel distances to get water. And they're the most sensitive to sanitation, air pollution, and water quality. So if we see what happens to infants in their early lives, then we see what would happen to everybody else long term. Uh, lesson three is the environmental consequences. And the objectives of that are to understand how energy poverty degrades uh, environmental health. And this is mostly through human action. The indicators we use to look into this are greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, and plant species threatened, which alludes to biodiversity loss. And the Bloom's taxonomy level that we hit in this lesson are the same as lesson two, understanding through analyzing. So again, they're moving away from the recall and they're trying to analyze what really happens when you don't have energy access. So lesson four is titled, The Multidimensional Challenges of Alleviating Energy Poverty. And this lesson took place off of this year because of the content that we were presenting with it. It's not exactly an issue that can easily be found in indicators. So we decided to do it off of this sphere. So the objectives for this lesson were to establish the necessi necessity of alleviating energy poverty, as well as to uh, explore the dimensions of society that present challenges in alleviating po energy poverty, such as the cultural, social, political, environmental, and economic aspects of society. So in order to do this, we used a case study of transitioning from transitional, uh, traditional unclean and inefficient cook stoves that exist in developing countries 
transitioning to improved, clean, and efficient cook stoves. Um, we presented students with the information that this technology exists, and ideally, it could be used to um, eliminate the aspect of energy poverty that involves unclean cooking. However, energy poverty still exists because of these socio-cultural boundaries. So, different areas, and this is because different areas of the world have different needs in cook stoves, such as people cook different dishes, dishes, and some cultures even revere their traditional cook stoves, as well as some just prefer the taste of food that's cooked on a traditional open fire. So, because of this, adaption rates are low, even when improved cook stoves are given to people for free. For example, in a 2014 study, 276 Kenyan households were given uh, improved cook stoves for free, but 52% of those households rejected the cook stoves, even with all the added benefits. So the Bloom's level that this lesson operates on is uh, the higher levels of analyzing, evaluating, and creating, because it encourages students to analyze the system's dynamics around energy poverty and why that creates a problem, as well as to create solutions for overcoming these barriers. So for the future work we anticipate with this project, we hope that future capstones will pick it up and expand the lessons, as well as conduct beta testing and piloting to evaluate the success of the lessons. We also anticipate that JMU professors may try to teach with it. We also entered lesson one of our product into the SOS student contest and were selected as the winners. So we'll be attending the NOAA SOS workshop conference next week in Detroit, and we'll present and we hope to gain recognition for our project. Um, as a part of winning this contest, we are also, uh, our data sets for lesson one were published onto the online SOS data catalog. So that will also achieve recognition. So to wrap up our conclusions for this project, the main points that we hope people to take away from observing these lessons are that energy is necessary for human well-being. And also that people in energy poverty are trapped in this because of the feedback loop between global poverty and energy poverty. Finally, we want people to understand that energy poverty must be alleviated because it's a detrimental issue, not only for the people directly suffering from it, but for the entire world. And there were three forms of contributions that this project provided. The first was to us. We learned a lot through our data analysis and gained a lot of new skills, such as lesson planning and ArcGIS. And we also, our work was published onto the SOS data catalog. There's also contributions to the audience that uh, observes our lessons um, and increasing awareness of energy poverty complexities. And there's also contributions to the SOS data network and JMU through creating these four lesson packages. We would just like to thank a couple of people, like our family and friends, thank you for your support for the past two and a half year journey. I'd like to thank Noah for uh, nominating us winners and we're really excited to go present on Tuesday. Uh, thank you, Elise Mazur, especially. She's our GSTA who helped us learn GIS from the ground up. I'd like to thank Dr. Deaton and Dr. Brittenhouse for all their work with us on the population density map. That was more than a struggle. And thank you especially to our advisors, Dr. Hartman and Dr. Papadakis, for everything, all your feedback and dedication to this project as well noted. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Did you try to present any data on the one here? And, um, more? We didn't pilot or evaluate the success of the lessons at all, but we did take a trip just to make sure that the lessons could be projected onto the sphere. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah so so we yeah. did see that they work. Cool. So that one image you saw in the lesson one, the the orange map on the sphere, that was actually ours on the sphere. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so do you guys actually had a class with the SOS teaching style or you just because uh, I know you guys said you had a, a class introduce you to the energy poverty mm -hmm. aspect of it did the SOS kind of just branch out of you guys uh, out of creativity or had that come about well, actually, well go for it. Um, actually so when we were jumping around from advisors we didn't have a project set in mind mm -hmm. and when we talked to Dr. Hartman she's the one who said hey do you want to work with science on a sphere and we said that sounds awesome because we've used it in ISAT 112 so yeah, it was really just thanks to Dr. Hartman's idea to use that as our teaching tool. Cool. Okay. Um, I was wondering if your experience uh, trying to think about learning objectives and designing lesson plans impacted your experience as learners in your ISAT classes, if it made you see things differently in terms of what your own professors are doing and, and thinking about that, or if it didn't connect in mm -hmm. that way for you. 
That's actually a really interesting question. Um, if I were to think about it now, yeah, I, I can't believe how much work goes into each lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys stand up here and talk for 50 to 75 minutes, and you guys do it with such ease. We have a long way to go. But yeah, we didn't realize how much went into it. We're like, OK, yeah, we'll make four or five lesson plans. And it is so much more work than we ever could have anticipated. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, just from my own experience, I feel like often when I run into constraints, it kind of, sometimes I get new ideas or I think of other things I can do. And I was wondering if when you had some of those data sets you really wanted to use, but they were incomplete, if you had any ideas for other kinds of lesson plans that might integrate well in, you know, that we're not using SOS, but might comp be complementary or kind of be integrated somehow into the classroom part of the lesson plan or something like mm -hmm. that. That's kind of what we did with lesson four because mm -hmm. when analyzing like the cultural and social dynamics of energy poverty, like I can't think of any indicators that come to mind that could be displayed on a sphere mm -hmm. to represent cultural aspects. So with the incomplete data, that would be, because it's not data that's inaccurate, it's just incomplete. So that would be useful <coughs> to bring into a lesson that isn't used on the sphere. Mm -hmm. Or you could look at the numerical data for certain representative countries and kind of think about that as representing all types of underdeveloped or all types of developed. You could do it that way, too. Joe? In the grand scheme of you know, solving energy poverty, what do you hope uh, the results will be of teaching more and more people? Well, when you learn about energy poverty, it's something you're just surprised that not a lot of people know about, that there's not a lot of action toward it. So we're hoping that just as awareness grows, then more people will want to take action. Yeah, we hope that eventually this will spark someone, and then it'll spark someone, and eventually energy poverty, the goal seven of sustainable development goals will eventually actually be achieved. That's our hope. Okay, well, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you so much.